Welcome to our April service dog handler chat. Um, we're really excited for spring to be coming, and we know that with spring comes a lot of additional challenges with, oh, leash management for one, getting out and about a little bit more. We're kind of in the height of like, we almost had summer weather yesterday, but a week ago we had a snowstorm and tomorrow we have rain and cold wind and it's just all over the place, which can also make practicing leash skills outside very challenging, especially for a six month old puppy that really hasn't gotten to explore a whole lot of environments as of yet because of our weather. <laughs> so, I'm excited for this chat. I do know an awful lot about leash manners. However, our special guest today is somebody who really has focused on this and experienced some challenges that I think are a little bit more extreme than what the average dog owner has faced. And therefore, it's allowed her to kind of fine tune things from what I've seen. And I don't know her as well as I wish that I did. But so our special guest today is Amanda Van Tessel, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about leash manners. Amanda, go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit better. Hi. Um, thanks, Penny. I'm I'm really excited to be here today. Um, yeah, same thing. It's been great getting to know you through the different conferences that we've been a part of. So it's awesome to to kind of be here and chatting about leash walking today. Um, I am, I've been a dog trainer for a little over three years now. Um, and it, it was a very fast progression for me. Um, I was already interested in the dog training world and started taking a course while I was still employed at my old job in the corporate world. And eventually just well, it was actually when COVID hit. I had a COVID breakdown, let's be honest. And I went, I I can't stand my job anymore. I can't do this. I can't do the corporate life. And I'm going to start my own dog training business. And everybody thought I was absolutely nuts. But here I am, you know, three and a half years later, um, killing it. <laughs> so I, um, over the last few years, have done a ton of continuing education and through doing that, and then through getting my first uh, puppy as an adult, I discovered the world of loose leash walking. Um, and it was quite a journey to kind of get there. So I took everything that I learned from Mabel, my dog, and from the education that I had gained over the last few years, and really started to specialize in the loose leash walking field. It's such a it's such an important piece of our relationship with our dogs. It's also one of the toughest things to manage and master uh, for us and for the dog. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it really kind of came to me and I don't even really deal with things like um, reactivity or aggression on leash. It's more of the overexcited, over exuberant, must meet everybody. <laughs> it's, uh, it can be, you know, the same tactics, but those are really the types of dogs that I absolutely love working with. And it is, you know, kind of like you said, Penny, it goes back to where I came from. My life with Mabel was so, so difficult. She was a really, really tough puppy. I was a new dog trainer. Um, and I honestly felt like throwing in the towel some days because of dealing with her. The potty training was awful right from a really young age. She was super bad on leash. And I, I was so busy training other people's dogs that I wasn't taking the time to train my own dog. So I ended up having to really take a whole bunch of steps backwards and restart everything from square one with Mabel now, to give you a little bit of context here, I picked Mabel, or she picked me, before I realized I wanted to be a service dog trainer. So I found a cute little Beagle Cocker Spaniel mix and thought, she's going to be mine. This is, this is my girl. This is who I'm bringing home into my life. And then I decided I wanted to be a therapy dog and service dog trainer. 
Um, and to do that, I needed a demo dog to go through that program to learn how to train service dogs. And Mabel went on that journey with me. And it was hilarious um, and frustrating, to be quite honest, to see this dog go through all of the the training and tasking that a service dog has to go through. Um, and it was, you know, that that beagle in her just takes over and the ears turn off some days and the nose turns on and you get next to nothing done. So there's, you know, the challenges of the breed alone that I chose. Now, other people that are on the hunt for service dogs may be making different decisions on the dog that they choose. And honestly, had I known that I was going to be a service dog trainer, I never would have made the choice that I did. But I never in a million years regret the dog that I have. She's made me a more patient dog mom, a better dog trainer. Um, and she's just hilarious. I mean, it's really funny. Oh, there she goes. She's going to start barking now. <laughs> I can I, definitely understand that one. Um, yeah. I have a husky service dog. <laughs> right. And to most of my clients, I would never, ever, ever recommend a husky <laughs> for a service dog. Yeah, it's, uh, he's it's one of those me. things. You, you you work with the dog that you have at the time, right? And I um, do have to say that Azul is one of the calmest huskies that I've ever known. Nice. But we also started with that very, very young. Yes, absolutely. That's huge. Malinois service dog. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those are very high drive, very, you know, they always need a job. So it's, yeah, it's, they're tasking a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> we and, do and still occasionally to be... struggle with leash manners. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like uh, I... Indoors Azul is awesome. And you know, that's work mode. Basically when he's inside, he's in work mode. His leash skills are spot on. Yeah. But the second we step outside, which is when I usually let him go into dog mode, and he can be obnoxious on a leash if he wants to be. <laughs> yeah, totally. I took Mabel to do some distance sessions with another dog who was a bit fear reactive. And she was an absolute nightmare that day. And it was because I realized we really do hibernate over the winter months. So we were kind of walking the same dead end stretch of road. It's nice and quiet. We don't see a lot of people or other dogs. And we just spent the last four months doing that. So I was like, oh, yeah, no wonder. <laughs> you know, The nice right. thing is, is that she's had enough training now, though, that it's only uh, a little bit of kind of refresher work to kind of get her back into the proper behaviors that I'm looking for when I'm using her as a demonstration dog for with another animal. Um, but it's, yeah, it was kind of a moment of frustration. And then I realized it was sort of my fault. I, I was the one that did that. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. for Azul, when he's really struggling, it's usually because I'm be trying to be the super, super dog handler of having multiple dogs with me, Yeah, which I've yeah. always been able to do. But so previously I've had German shepherds that like, easily walked beside each other no problem and didn't really feed off each other too much maybe a little bit of fear with the one that was fearful but um Azul gets annoyed when other dogs don't know the rules like he knows the rules <laughs> and right. when I have like I had a foster for a little while and so walking both of them when she got obnoxious he gets annoyed and then all of a sudden he's obnoxious too yeah. and same with the puppy now with Bell is he like yesterday Azul and I went on a great walk together we were just fine calm cool collected other dogs everything even ignoring the squirrels in the trees and everything and then about two hours later, we went on another walk with my husband and my husband was holding the six month old puppy's leash and I had Azul and Azul was a total spaz just because she was there. Yeah. So Changes in environment, exactly. their emotional state. Yeah. It all makes a difference on how that walk is about to go. So shall we dive a little bit into like what the topic is leash manners and we know that that is a lot of different things. Shall we dive into what 
we refer to when we talk about like loose leash walking. And yeah. um, I know this is huge. We've had this discussion before amongst our crazy to calm canine coaches, as far as like what I need from leash manners, especially if we're just looking at outdoor environments, what I need is totally different than what Cindy needs because I live in rural Michigan. So my son looked up these population statistics the other day, right? All of the UP has a lower population than the city of Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is one of the biggest cities in Wisconsin, bigger cities in Wisconsin. Yeah. The whole UP, which is an eight hour drive from east to west. How big our population is low. How big is Green Bay? It was over 30,000. That's what Daniel was looking for. He was looking for a town that had over 30,000 people because he was looking for some weird shop that's supposed to be readily available in towns of over 30,000. But so, the whole UP area that's like two hours driving distance tall and eight hours wide, <laughs> and there isn't 30,000 people in it. Which is completely different than my environment where I live in a, a metropolitan area of, I live in California and our B city of Fresno, which I mean, people have heard of Fresno because everybody makes fun of Fresno, but it's not a small city. It's um, half million plus. Actually, it's probably closer to a million when you count the surrounding areas, even though we're surrounded, that's all surrounded by agriculture. So it's a very different environment than what Penny's in and what my my dog's skills need are completely different than what Penny needs. Absolutely. And, you know, even in my city where we have this nice central core, it's a small size city, but it's, you know, like you said, once you get into the outer populations, we're looking at about half a million people in the total Halifax area. So it's, but I live in a very rural like subdivision. So it's all, it's still a subdivision, but it's on the very outskirts of the city. So it's getting more quiet. There's more wildlife out here. Um, no sidewalks, but bigger kind of shoulders of the road and way fewer people. Um, so it's, yeah, it's much different than me taking my dog into the downtown city core and expecting um, the same behavior. Because right now, to be quite honest, if I did that, my dog would be an absolute nightmare. <laughs> it's It was because we don't practice in those environments as often as maybe we should, but I haven't needed it up to this point. So yeah, to your point, yeah, it it's very, very different. Um, so for me, generally speaking, when I'm dealing with clients, I, of course, loose leash and heel are two very, very different things. Um, so heel is, you know, absolute, you know, focus on you, close to you, not even necessarily in that, you know, perfect heel position, but close to it, right? Um, whereas loose leash walking for me, I always look at it as my personal bubble. I, you know, there's always that, that, point, usually about that three foot distance around yourself or so, that um, if if somebody crossed over into that, that would be your personal space. It would make you uncomfortable. But that's your dog's comfort zone. That's kind of where I like to keep when I'm looking for proper loose leash walking on a standard six foot leash. I like my dog to be in that personal bubble. So you can be to my left or to my right, depending on the environment that we're in. You can be a little bit ahead of me, um, but I want that slack on the leash. I want that smiley face or the J shape in the leash so that I know that my dog isn't necessarily um, damaging herself. Uh, my dog hates harnesses, believe it or not. <laughs> she can put a vest on, but she hates an actual walking harness. So I walk her on a collar really uh, really important for me not to be causing damage to my dog's neck 
um, all of the sensitive things that are going on in there. So I need her to have that little bit of loose leash, regardless of where she's at, on what side, whether she's in front or behind. But it's really that that personal space that I'm looking for her to be in. For Azul, or for me, um, so I I take a lot of flack for that because while I do teach that nice J in the leash to my clients when they want it, for me, I actually need tension in the leash because one of my service dog tasks is the forward momentum pull, and Azul doesn't go outside other than like just loading into the car kind of thing in a collar. He always has a harness on so that he can do that, and he's a husky that was bred to pull so he loves to do that so our leash is always tight but my goal is that the pull is a nice controlled steady even pull not a jagged so for me a loose leash walking is more of a mental state versus the physical is like are we mentally connected is he paying attention to where I need him to be is he also paying attention enough in the environment? Because I want him to predict certain things. You know, we're about to come to a road. That means if he's out in front of me, he needs to stop and wait for me to catch up. So we always cross the road together, things like that. Yeah. And so as long as his focus is able to do that, I don't care if he's sniffing or marking his tree or whatever. As long as he's not pulling me to get to the tree. Yeah, You know, and he's not zigzagging and being crazy, which is what Belle kind of does right now at six months old. <laughs> Her nose hits the ground and she runs back and forth like a pig, I think, just yeah. snooting and nothing along the ground. But um, so, I mean, that's my definition for loose leash is that we're connected in a way that we're able to predict each other and follow each other's simple cues easily. <laughs> I like that. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I like how you made a point to say it's about a mental state, you know, because yeah, there are, there's going to be times where there's some tension on the leash there for sure. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like, um, I guess my ideal state versus uh, reality almost or real, yeah, real world application. There's, there's slight differences there at times. And, and some people have different expectations than others, like you said, and it also boils down to um, the dog I'm walking. Yes. So Azul being four years old and having four years worth of training, basically, like he learned at a pretty young age what stay on your side means to me. Which, so basically, if we're walking a sidewalk or a trail and there's somebody coming at us, I can remind Azul to stay on his side. And most times I don't even remind him anymore. He just automatically does it and they walk past and he doesn't try to greet them. Now, if I tried to do that with Belle in her current puppiness, she'd be racing to greet that person. Sure. So whenever that kind of distraction is coming our way, then she's coming back into that loose heel with a shorter leash and staying closer beside to make it easier for her to learn that we're not interacting with every person we come across. Yeah. So the dog I'm walking really impacts, you know, what that loose leash walking looks like based yeah. on the previous training they've had. Go ahead, Cindy. Okay. I just wanted to say um, it also, I, I think you can also change it with equipment with what you're expecting from the dog. So like Nick does a couple things where he does a momentum pull and he is doing carting. And he's going to be doing some modified um, pulling um, dry land mushing type stuff. And so when he's in a harness, I actually want tension on the harness. If that's what I'm, if he's connected to something with the harness, because he's going to want to either pull the, pull the cart or pull, pull me. And so he, so with him, I've taught him that if I'm, if, there, if there's tension on the harness, he's going to pull. And then if he's on the collar, he's expect he's expected to be um, with a loose leash next to me in heel, uh, not in he not healing, but basically in the bubble of heel, um, because he has a whole separate heel cue. So he's got multiple things he's got to do that are that involve walking near me, 
And I think, and then it also varies with the leash. If he's on his flexi, when we go out for a potty walk, there's going to be tension on it because that's how a flexi works. Unless I call him in and I have the leash locked and there's a, I can have him loose leash walk with that as well. But it's important, you know, that there's some context you know, that to, for people to understand also that you can have context with your um, equipment that you're using with your dog, as far as, you know, harness versus flat collar versus leash what you're using it for you know i totally agree with that i have a big one with that um lud go ahead you had your hand raised yes i wanted to comment that oh Kata. <laughs> uh i i have like the same situation as cindy because i trained some uh, mobility some light mobility but also we train uh, bike sports like IGP and uh, we have a moment that the dog has to lunge and pull and bark and all of this but we have like a protection gear for it and uh, the harness like means okay it's time to pull it's time to do the stuff and they, this harness is not compatible uh, with the mobility equipment so uh, we started using a martingale uh, I know some people don't like it, but uh, in my opinion, the way it distributes the pressure is better than uh, having the pressure only here, like in a flat collar. Uh, but it depends on the person, of course. Um, but it it has been um, much better than only trying to use a harness. So yeah, a collar can be very useful, even if you're not using it for force. Uh, and it's like a discriminative uh, stimulus, just like any other. Uh, you can use more than voice. You can use contacts and uh, the environment. That's it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I <clears throat> a very similar vein. I use uh, different uh, lengths of leashes to to kind of tell Mabel what type of walk that we're going on. So she knows when I bring out the six foot leash that we're going into the car and we're usually just making a stop at the dog park where she goes off leash or we're heading out into public to do a little bit of work somewhere. Um, when I'm walking in my quiet rural subdivision, I have a 20 foot long line or a 50 foot long line that I can put her on so that I still have a little bit of slack in that leash because she can really pull like a freight train for a little dog. She is strong. So I like being able to give her that little bit of extra leash because she's just naturally faster than I am. So it's letting her be 15 feet ahead of me. And still having that little bit of loose leash gives us a much happier walk for both of us. She's exploring and sniffing and backtracking and zigzagging and doing her thing. But I'm not bothered by it because she's got that extra leash to work with. Yeah, like um, with my clients, I mean, my experience has been that um, sometimes only giving a dog a longer leash solves like most of problems because the dog is pulling just because uh it wants to sniff something or uh pay attention to something and it's uh super uh normal for a dog we can't ask them focus 24 7 and looking at us especially because walks are supposed to be fun so uh i have had uh, cases that only given uh Oh, Katana, a uh, longer leash already solved 90% of the problems. So yeah, I super agree with you. Yeah, it's, uh, leashes are, they can be such an amazing tool to use for sure. Yeah, it's, it's like to be able to give a, a person such a simple tool to use and see such a difference immediately gives them that little bit of hope that they need that, there is potential there for their dog. It's like the quick win that we can give our clients to say, there, there's hope for you. <laughs> and there's there's hope for your dog. It's not uh, it's not the be all end all and all is not lost at the end of the day too. Yeah. I think that was an important one. It kind of leads us into the idea of sniff abouts, um, freedom walks, whatever you want to call them. There's a lot of different names for them, but it basically means 
the type of walk where your dog is being a dog out exploring the environment. And so, I mean, for me, if I'm outside, that's usually the kind of walk we're doing on a minimum of 15 foot long leash. <laughs> that's usually what we do. Um, but for a lot of other people, they have to focus more on the tighter range, short leashes for more of the time and only do sniff about a couple of days a week. So I think it's, for my clients, what I found the biggest thing that helps is finding the balance that is right for them. So if their dog is really, really struggling on leash and they're spending most of their time with a six foot leash walking a community, you know, houses, neighbors, other dogs barking, that kind of thing. Then getting more of those sniff abouts out in nature, even if you're out in a field or walking a baseball field when it's not baseball season, if you can get out in that open space where your dog can sniff more often, that can really impact your loose leash walking ability. The dog can then walk better on a leash when you do walk your neighborhood walk because they've had time to explore in other areas. Absolutely. And I think too, in those uh, really, well, in some of the urban neighborhoods in my city anyway, we've got um, sidewalk and then a little patch of grass and then road. So if you're lucky enough to be in a situation like that as well in, in your town or city, even that little patch of grass can be an amazing sniff zone for your dog. It's just about slowing yourself down a little bit, being a bit more patient with your dog. If you're not able to use a 10 or 15 foot leash, maybe an eight foot leash up from the six foot standard, um, that can be enough to give that little bit of freedom, that little bit of sniffing to create some of the calmness that we all need and want and just really satisfy our dogs. You know, it's finding those little moments throughout the day that you can really give them what they need, um, especially when we're dealing with service dogs and working animals. Um, I think it's so important that we're aware and, and cognizant of their needs just as much as they're working to help us with our needs. I totally agree with that. And I think it's a matter of we have to find that balance of, you know, taking care of them versus them taking care of us. And usually the people that I see struggling the most are the ones that haven't figured out that balance that works well for them yet. So if we switch tracks a little bit, um, I know everyone here probably has a little bit of a different things that they do before they work on teaching heel or in the early stages of teaching a heel type behavior. So for me, it's um, A, we always start training indoors like many other things. You know, this is very common. Always start in a low distraction environment. The training center makes it amazing for that. And Bell has great manners indoors, off leash. Perfect. <laughs> because that's where she's had the most of her practice healing. At least it can get a little bit worse, but she still does pretty good indoors. But um, then before I ever let my clients step outdoors and ask for a heel outdoors, I make sure they've taught their dog a release cue, a way to say, all right, you don't have to heal anymore, whatever that may be. So, I mean, in some situations, like you said, you might use the six foot leash to go to the dog park. The cue is you're taking the leash off and they're free to run, right? But what if your environment is in an area where you can just take the leash off and they're free to run and you just want them to be free to go out and sniff or, you know, whatever it is. Maybe you're on a long line and Azul will go through the field hunting for mice and moles and stuff, you know, whatever it is. So before they're ever allowed, when they're in training with me, to ask their dog to heal outside, they also have to be able to have that release cue built in. I asked you to heal. All right, now go do something else, whatever. You know, so some people would choose to use the word like free or release. Um, and for me, it's always a go. I'm going to send my dog to go do something else. Go sniff, go play, go in some way, go. <laughs> so go is really my release cue. 
So how about you, Amanda? Let's start there. Um, what what are your kind of go-tos for when you're starting to switch from that loose leash to the heel kind of training? So I think uh, very similar to you, I wanted that cue in place. Um, and it's funny, Mabel will respond pretty well inside to her release cue. Uh, and I suspect it's often because I'm tossing a treat away as well. <laughs> but outside, she struggles to respond to that. Um, so what I've ended up using is go on or let's go, you know, kind of thing. And it, it prompts her to kind of move uh, out of position and heal. Um, but for me, it was to to start the trans transition from inside to outside heal. For me, it was really... Um, figuring out the high value rewards that we're going to get my dog's focus outside as well um, and start that transition that way. So she's also a little dog um, and I was, uh, my back is really in not great shape at all. So I used a spatula, a mixing spoon, dunked in peanut butter or wet food and held that down so that we were basically starting from scratch, but outside and I had that super high value stuff that I was going to be able to occupy her with. Um, sometimes I'll even have little bits of, um, or not even bits, whole sardines that are dried. that are long enough to kind of hold down and kind of keep her attention, get her into that heel position and slowly build up that practice. Um, another big one for me was I'm, uh, again, not everybody has this, but I have a big long driveway. So it was a nice transition to a lower distraction outdoor environment before we actually hit the sidewalks, practicing our loose leash and our heel walking. Does anybody else want to kind of chime in their go-tos, uh, you know, for making that switch from indoors to moving outdoors and advancing the training a little bit? I, I, usually, unmuted. <laughs> I usually actually start with heel, with the heel position be because I want, a nice tight loose leash walk freedom when we're when we're getting into the service dog stuff i want the dog or if we're just going for a walk that doesn't that where they can't go out you can't be free i want them to be i want that position next to me to be highly rewarded so it's always high re, highly rewarded and i start with getting their attention inside and then i it my latest dog nick um my current service dog has been a challenge because he wouldn't take food in public. He spit it out for the first two years um, just because of the way he is. I mean, he's not an easy dog um, because it's very difficult to reward like when you're doing public access training with a dog that doesn't want to eat. So um, I worked a lot with getting him in a heel position, first inside, then outside. And then we when we did go on walks, we had a big backyard when he was really little, but when we did go on walks, he was managed with a um, harness at the time and transitioned over to a collar and a head halter as he got a little bit older and a very highly conditioned head halter. And um, then gradually he's re he's gained all this freedom so that if I didn't live where I live now, when I had him outside, there's a good chance I'd have him off leash a lot. Um, but I like to start with it. I like to start with a higher, not necessarily a higher criteria, but I like to start with that. This is where I want you. This is where you're going to be rewarded. And I really want you looking up at me, but you don't have to all the time and really, really rewarding that. And then granting more freedoms as they gain the skills. Because for me, it, 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 I found, especially with Nick, it helps him. Uh, it's helped him understand the concept of staying of me being rewarding and it's also helped with the concept of you know there's a little bit more privileges you get to do more you have more off-leash time and we have like all done we usually play a game when I release him from something it definitely all has to like there's so much into leash walking or leash manners in my mind like you can't do it all at once. You can't train it all at once. You got to pick and choose, you know, um, what is your criteria for the dog you have right now 
to be able to be successful, to do the kind of walk you need to walk? What is your top priority kind of thing? <laughs> and then you can phase in other behaviors as they get to know it. Like um, my dogs are all trained to go to the left or the right, like either around a tree or pole or, you know, if there's a split in the trail, I can tell them which way we're going and they'll automatically go. But that's definitely not a top priority that we teach until they have decent enough leash manners that I can trust them out in front of me enough to do it. <laughs> so I don't even necessarily work with a lot of my clients on teaching that because for them, that's it's not the priority. You know, for me, it's a high priority eventually. But <laughs> so I do think we have to kind of pick and choose, you know, with the dog that we have in the moment what it is that's most important, what lessons do they need to learn so that to me, the number one reason we ever have a dog on a leash is safety. <laughs> and so if we want to be walking our dogs and our dogs want to be out on a walk with us, anytime we're leaving our property, we have to have that safety in place so that we can use it to just make the walk more successful. You know, without that safety in place, that's when we are coming home frustrated, we're sore, maybe our dog was bouncing back and forth all over the sidewalk or pulling on our arm, barking, whatever it is, whatever that case may be, when we don't have that safety connection between us mentally, and the leash helps do it physically as well, but I mean, I want that mental safety connection first and foremost before I begin to add in the other skills that I want within my leash manners. Go ahead, Cindy. Uh, there. Um, so what I just wanted to say, I wanted to read Rayanne's comment. She said, as a power chair user, I did what Cindy describes because the heel zone is a safe zone for Evelyn's paws. She needs to learn heel right away. That's part of what it is. But I also want to say that the leash as a communication tool isn't just between us and our dogs. I mean, it, it it's not a steering wheel. It's a connection. But it also tells people, my dog is under control. My dog is trained. And my dog is, I, my dog is, knows they're not supposed to go near you unless they're invited near you. Um, just by having the looser, you know, having less tension in the leash. So it's safety, not just for us and our dogs. It's also, you know, safety giving um, security to the, the public. I had a dog years ago that she was a great Pyrenees, which they're supposed to, you know, they, they're famously called disappears. And um, she was off leash 99% of the time. The only time she was ever on leash was when other people needed her to be on leash, as in we were in a group of people in public where there were people that weren't with us that didn't know her and didn't know she would stay next to me. And I think that that piece of equipment or that piece of communication, not just um, between us and our dogs, but also between us and the public is super, super important. I think that's really important for service dog handlers too. I've noticed that, um, just my choice in leash when I'm working my dog out in public conveys a message to other people around. So like generally if I'm in a public place in a work environment, I either use a hands-free leash where it's a shoulder strap combination or as well as usually clipped to my belt. And so in that situation, he is um, typically work environment on a less than two foot leash. We're talking, this is a public place. We're usually indoors. He needs to do a modified heel. His leash is long enough for him, for him to switch from one side of me to the other if I need him to and bounce back into his loose heel. And so when I started using that shorter leash, I had far less people asking to pet him. When I have a six foot leash on him, even if he's in that same, you know, two foot distance around me, he is far more likely to get people to ask to pet him because they realize I can release him. You know, he can move further away because he's on a longer leash, right? 
So I think you hit that kind of really important that the, the tools we use also does communicate to the people around us what it, we're expecting. And another, um, going back to the sniff about side of that, a good example yesterday on my walk with Azul was we were walking a very wooded path that is probably 10 foot wide. And I had Azul on a 15 foot leash and he's sniffing and doing his own thing. And this older than me gentleman popped out of the woods a little bit ahead of the trail kind of thing. And I saw him kind of slow his pace when he looked at us. Because here it's Azul almost out at the end of his 15 feet, totally not paying attention to the guy at all. Totally not even like it doesn't look like he's focused on me, but I know Azul and he is paying attention to my whereabouts. And the guy slowed down because he's a little 70 pounds and he's all black or mostly black and can have an intimidating stare. And I knew the guy was apprehensive of walking by. And I said, you know, I told him out front, I said, it's okay. You can just proceed on right on by. He doesn't care about you. You're nothing to him. <laughs> and had the guy not done anything else and just walked by, the guy, it all would have been fine. The guy chose to answer that was, I was admiring how gorgeous he was, which of course Azul knows that word. So gorgeous head comes up and he looks at him, still stays exactly where he's at, right? But just looks at him. And I'm like, well, he he's a service dog. He's very well trained. He would love to say hi to you if you want to. And Azul knows those words very well. So he knows that that I'm okay with it. But he waits for the guy to say, sure, I'd love to say hi. And then his feet finally moved for the first time to go over and greet the person who was still standing about 10 feet away from me. You know, that's not a freedom I could give Belle at this point. I could let her go say hi to the person, but she's definitely going to be closer to me. <laughs> but knowing that Azul has that, I understand the guy's hesitance, though, because there are dogs that if they were that far away from their person, I wouldn't want to invade their bubble. You know, Azul had a lot of freedom. He could have easily crossed the trail quickly, jumped on the guy, tripped the guy, whatever, accidentally. I knew Azul wouldn't do that from history and experience, but the guy didn't know that. So I think that communication piece is really big. I'm seeing Ashlyn's hand, so I'm assuming there's a comment there. Just let me get to where I see it. I can. My comments are all weird. So yeah, she teaches the heel position with targets first inside. And then she has the ability to have, she does have the ability to have her dog off leash outside. So she starts there as well. And then hand targets to recall when the dog gets a little too far away. Hand targets are one of my all time favorites for teaching leash skills. It's the first thing I teach all my clients, service dog or not service dog. They all learn how to do hand targets. <laughs> Hatch's first thing in puppy school I teach uh, after Mark Ward. <laughs> yeah. And then Ashlyn also does use the power chair. So she has a six foot space around her that she doesn't want her dogs into. So, um, Lud, you want to go ahead? Yes. Uh, like, still about the teaching those leash heel inside or outside uh it also depends a lot on the dog uh, as you all were saying um uh, but like i have two examples here of dogs that uh different ways that i taught uh usually i i i teach them all dogs i try to teach uh heel by default because it's the reward zone and i want them to if they don't know what to do uh, they go to the reward zone and yeah, okay, great. Uh, because that's what I want by default. And all uh, we do, uh, except on very higher levels, like the B8 uh, tests, obedience trials that we have here, that the dog has to face you, it's usually all uh, in the hill position. So uh, that's one of my priorities. Uh, but also I work mostly uh, with competition dogs. I have only one client that doesn't do competition and now she's going to competition. So 
uh, that's what I, we are doing now. Um, but also I like to go, uh, like to teach inside because of the walls. Um, like there are dogs that are uncomfortable with this, uh, but most of my dogs aren't. Uh, I have big dogs, Borzois and, and Shepherds, so they are okay. Uh, so I use the walls to uh, to keep them on the uh, like the position, or I use uh, uh, the middle position between my legs because it keeps the dog on the position uh, and like accompanying you. Uh, but also there are some cases that like two dogs that I got here, they uh, one of them were. Uh, like Kalinka, she's a Borzoi rescue and she would be very fearful of everything and she wouldn't go on the leash without panicking. So I would uh, go to a place that is not busy, a place that I could let her off leash and go with my another like my other Borzoi because she wouldn't go very far from him. Uh, but then she could explore and be more confident and build this confidence of, uh, outside. And I'm doing kind of the same thing with my other puppy, uh, but with a long leash. Uh, I have one dog on, this, uh, on my short leash and another on the long leash. Then the, the dog on the long leash will like kind of mimic the first dog. And that's a way that I usually don't see, but uh, it's working for us and also building confidence uh, faster, you know. So, yeah, there are a lot of ways, uh, but that's it. I like walls and I like how to uh, how to introduce it to make very rewarding and very fun for the dog to do and, you know, keep it short what you already knew. Yeah. I love walls. Um, that was definitely one of the things that I worked on with Mabel and she doesn't like molding. Um, she's a little bit not touch sensitive, but a little bit. <laughs> it's one of those things like if you try to move her, she looks very disturbed by it. So it's not a uh, molding is not something I typically do with Mabel. So using the wall was really comfortable for us. And um my hallway is set up so that we could start in the open and then move towards the wall. And she seemed really comfortable with that. Um, so it made it a little bit easier than asking her to come right up against the wall right off the bat. We kind of started out in the middle and then I moved her a little bit closer as we uh, worked our way down the hallway and that seemed to work for her. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting how, um, there's so many different little ways that you can tackle the exact same goal or problem. Um, and and it it's so important because like you had said, every dog is so, so different from each other that it, there's not one prescriptive way of going about doing this. And I feel like a lot of uh, dog train or uh, dog training clients believe that there's this, you know, one solution. <laughs> and it's really not the case. Like what, what will work for one dog won't at all for another. Um, that's why my loose leash walking program online is so big, because there's there's so many different games you can play to get the same end result. But not every dog is going to want to play every game that I have for them. Um, so yeah, it's it's very interesting to kind of see what works for each each candidate really that actually brings me into my final question because our hour has like just flown by and i want you to be able to start out amanda because i don't know that we are all going to get through being able to answer the question but so for you and thank mabel specifically for you and mabel if there was only one game that you could play to make your walking, your leash manners better, what is your favorite go-to game for you and Mabel? I like slow. Um, and it's it's super simple. It's just her starting to come to the end of her long line or leash and creating that little bit of tension 
and me using, um, well, and being able to use a slow cue to slow her down, essentially. And I, I taught that by working with her while she was already walking slowly with me and saying, slow, good girl, you know, and giving the rewards for that. And it's, it's kind of, um, through practice has become automatic enough for her that even just today it was, I've got a little video now that I can finally use for Instagram. And I was like, yes, I got it. <laughs> but it's, it's of her responding to that cue with that little bit of tautness in the leash. And it's uh, absolutely hands down the most handy piece that I've had with her because it's allowed me to let her more freely roam, get closer to the end of her leash without necessarily having to worry about her pulling or lunging or anything like that. I totally love that. I basically do the same thing, only my cue is far enough. <sighs> yeah. You know, it needs, you're about to run out of leash, so it's just a far enough. And usually, since I prefer a little bit of tension in my leash all the time, the leash is usually sliding in and out my hand a little bit. And it's usually very, very light tension. And so as Azul is starting to near the end of his longer line, I make, you know, I just make it a little bit stronger. So I'm still not stopping him, but just that little added tension. And and now he walks a lot on our property on a 50 foot long line and he knows exactly how far that is. So he can burst into the zoomies and run a hundred feet and both, you know, back and forth, back and forth and never hit the end because he's rehearsed that so much, but we've built that up just like you're slow. For me, my favorite go-to game is what I call the bucket game when it comes to leash manners. So if you're at all familiar with um, horse barrel racing, the setup looks kind of like that. But I find like what most dog owners, the mistake that most people, myself included, until I knew better, make when it comes to teaching leash manners is we think we're starting here and we need to reach there, point A to point B, right? And that's where we accidentally condition our young puppies to pull further and further on the leash as they're trying to race to that point B. And so a big trick is to make frequent turns. And, you know, if the dog is getting too far away, you change your direction. Works great in a field kind of thing. But I've found that the more clients I've trained with leash skills, the more clients start to recognize how, or, or, the more clients don't recognize when they need to change directions. And so by adding the bucket game, and it's one of the first games that we play in the training center, and we do it entirely off leash when we can, when we're not in a group class situation, so entirely off leash, the buckets can be positioned. I always use a minimum of three. You can use more than three, but I always say use a minimum of three because you need options. And you can put them really close together. I think like the closest I've ever done is about five feet. And that was with small dogs that were really struggling with staying in heel because they were checking out really fast, right? So the goal is before you round a bucket, you have to already have your mind made up of which bucket you're walking to next. You have two options always, no matter where you're coming from, you have two options or more. And then you're required to deliver a reinforcement at every bucket, regardless of depending on some teams that works better to deliver the reinforcement before they round the bucket. Some do it in the middle of rounding the bucket and some do it at the very end of rounding the bucket. And so I have my teams explore each one so that, that way they can learn what's working for them. <laughs> but then the buckets over time slowly spread out. So the clients are automatically learning how to not phase out reinforcement entirely, but basically build distance and duration for the behavior. The dogs are learning that staying in that position gets, is more reinforcing than getting out of that position. And the dogs are also learning how to get themselves back into position because the dogs off leash, when they step out of position, the owner can't do anything to get that dog back outside of maybe verbally calling them or, you know, giving them a hand target, something like that. 
But my rule is when the dog steps away, the owner's movement stops. Their feet are no longer able to move. They can give the dog cues if they want to and try to find something that works for them. Generally, I say, say their name, give them a hand target because they know hand targets first. And that gets most dogs back right away. But so the dogs are practicing getting back into heel on their own and staying in heel on their own. And then those buckets can then be taken outdoors. Now I use buckets simply because they're cheap and easy in the training center and I can stack them all together. But I've told people to use, you know, you can use chairs in the backyard, you can use traffic cones, you can use anything you want to. The goal is three objects that you can control how far apart they are from each other because you always start close and expand the game. And then once the dog gets really good, like, I mean, if I wanted to play with Belle, I could use cars in a parking lot because she has played the game since she was eight weeks old. She knows it well. So I can pick any three objects and she will do it. So that's my go-to game, my favorite one. I do have examples on my YouTube video that I can link. Cindy, do you want to talk about your go-to game? I think I have two. Um, I like the... Some people call it the reorientation game. It's kind of a variation of look at that. Basically, every time the dog looks at you, you throw a food, piece of food in the opposite direction where they have to run past you. And um, I use this all the time because it helps bring my dog's focus. Even as an adult, he's four and a half and he needs this and it really helps him. So um, we play that all the time everywhere um, just to reinforce his focus and then the other one i really like is i like um food catching where when you have them in the position I mean, when they're doing what they want what you want them to do you're throwing the food to reward for them to catch it as opposed to just tossing it on the floor on the ground and having them chase it now i use both but it's really really helpful when you're teaching loose leash walking and you just want your dog you know certain point to be able to have some food in your hand and drop it down at in you know at intervals not at a precise interval but just you know randomly drop it down and then they get in the habit of looking at your hand and watching what you're doing and when's the food coming when's the food coming and really paying attention to you as opposed to the rest of the environment when you need to be teaching that this is the reinforcement zone this is where I want you this is where you need to be for this particular activity once you got this we'll release you know we, we can release you out to go do other fun games too but right now we're learning this and so that's that's a big one for me and I, for me it's just easier to work on that tight heel and then let it re relax the criteria when i'm not needing it which is most of the time but, yep that's your environment of needing the tight heel more often Oh yeah, this much is my environment of rarely needing a tight heel. So I want my dog to learn how to be out in front of me or off to the side of me or whatever before I want them to learn to heal because that tight heel I very rarely need. <laughs> mm -hmm. So everybody has different priorities. Um, and Ashlyn does like the a modified proximity game. Um I also do something very, very similar that I like to call 24-hour bowling because it's basically sends the dog away from you in any direction. You want to send the dog and bring them back to you to get reinforcement. My dogs don't catch, so I tend to use hand targets versus catch. Not that they probably couldn't learn to catch. Azul is just not a fan. He wants to sniff his treats first, so if it's in my hand and he's doing a hand target, then he can sniff it first and then eat it. <laughs> doesn't have to catch it. Or if it's on the ground first, he'll chase it and then sniff it and then eat it. Even if I'm using the 20 of the exact same treat, he's got to sniff each and every one of them. <laughs> but so I do think there are a lot of great games that we could play. I know we have a lot of them in our fad workshop. We have what? Four times three, so we have 12 games listed in that workshop alone over the past three years where there's more games. I'm sure Amanda has a ton more games that we've never even heard of. And so there are a lot of great resources out there for games if you are looking for ways to be able to increase your dog's leash manners. 
there are plenty of us that can help you. I know I'm going to be releasing a Leash Manners ebook very, very shortly, just because I have so many clients that struggle specifically with this skill. And that's just going to be tips and tricks. And it's going to have some video component and links to videos that go along with what I'm talking about too. So it's going to be a fun thing. Amanda, do you have any resources that you want to share with our listeners? Uh, yeah, I do have, if you have to head to my website, uh, nohasseldogtraining.ca, there is a resources section there um, that's got uh, two different resources. One is uh, focus, um, uh, pattern games, basically. And another one is about including uh, enrichment in your uh, leash walking adventures. Um, so yeah, I've got that. And then I do a lot on Instagram. So you can find me there also at No Hassle Dog Training. I totally love pattern games. Yeah, we, they're great. We had a client in my Fearful Dogs group. Um, I do group walks very differently than most people. But so I had a client that we noticed no matter what, when this dog got reinforcement lives, like I eat the treat, I check out is what the dog's brain pattern was. I eat the treat, I check out. And we needed to really um, get that dog to think I eat the treat. And then I look to see what my person wants next. And so we did some of the Leslie McDermott's easy pattern games, like the up down game and the left right game to get that dog thinking in the, oh, there's another treat coming if I check back in. <laughs> and so, yeah, pattern games are great as well. Game changer for sure. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm sure like, I only know a little bit about pattern games. The ones that I do know, I totally love. And there's, I don't know. There's way more than what I, what I use. <laughs> <laughs> so, but with that, I think we have definitely gone a little bit over our hour. I think it's been a pretty good chat. I hope it's had lots of great tips for those that are watching this on replay. I will link Amanda's website in the notes. And um, if you guys want to reach out to her, I know she's always open for more Instagram followers. Oh yeah. I know we just started a crazy to calm Instagram account that is focusing on service dogs. My um, you for pause of love Instagram account is more uh, pet dog stuff. And the crazy to calm is more service dog stuff. And Cindy has a closed pause for play Instagram account. So in any of them, you can see some good tips and videos along the way as well. And with that, everybody have a great day.